Warning. The following podcast is utter nonsense and may cause agoraphobia, kleptomania, insomnia, and oppositional defiance disorder. We are required by law to provide you with this disclaimer for hazardous materials. And welcome back to Hazardous Materials, last week's comics, this week, wherein we talk about last week's comics, this week. And serve up our takes on the latest multimedia news to push us to that sweet, sweet hour mark for all that ad revenue. Indeed. My name is Casey Johnson. With me, as always, Gideon Gonzalez. So, getting started, let's talk about f- <laughs> Batman 89. Uh, <laughs> God damn. So, so I work in a comic book store, and uh, this issue really highlights... All of the faults of the direct market system. Yes. Wherein we pre- place our orders three months in advance. You After FOC, which is usually like about a month out, we can mm-hmm. no longer up our orders. So obviously what you do is you make a big multimedia announcement that a character is going to make their first appearance or something else gonna, big is going to happen the week before the book comes out. You know, just to take out any like narrative tension the story might have had. And also screw over retailers who now can't order enough to meet demand, especially when sales of Batman have been declining for the past three months. Yeah, well, I'm seeing stuff online that's like uh, the the name of the article on some of these things is don't buy Batman number 89 for 15 bucks. Yeah. Or or 30 bucks or 40 bucks on some of these. It's insane. This issue was pre-selling at 30 bucks and it's hanging around there with a couple of sales dipping up to the 45 level. And then there's also some misprint versions. I'm not sure what the issue with them is, but those things are selling for insane amounts of money. 700 on last year. Was that a graded one or uh, it could have been graded? Uh, I, it I, didn't, to be, I didn't look at it uh, quick yeah, enough because we just found it, out yeah. right before we started rolling. And it'd, be, it'd be impossible for that to be graded because the turnaround would be way too quick. Regardless. So let's actually talk about the issue. Yeah. The reason why it's so expensive is it's the first cameo appearance of Punchline. Punchline. Joker's newest uh, femme fatale arm candy who I'm not a big fan of the design, frankly. You can see right here. I like Jorge Jimenez's art in general, but this design's pretty bland and boring and doesn't do much for me. But now I did say cameo appearance. And I mean that in the strictest sense of the term because it's literally one panel that they showed the week before of her answering the phone. Actually, I looked into it. Two panels. Oh, two panels. See, uh, at the very beginning, when uh, Batman and, and Catwoman and, and Harley Quinn are all finding out everything has gone completely wrong, she's in a panel spying on them. Oh, I, man, I didn't even catch that. Yeah. I was kind of flipping. I actually read it. Oh, I was kind of <laughs> slipping through an issue. Yeah. Like, the designer's there, and he's whatever. I... So I love United Underworld from the Batman 66 movie. Mm -hmm. I adore that concept. It's so boring here. Like, it's, oh, the Joker, Riddler, Penguin, and Catwoman made a big plan from this guy, the designer, and he's coming to collect. He's got a big old D on his face. Yeah, and Catwoman finally uh, uh, owns up to the ending of the uh, wedding issue where she Mm -hmm. met up with all those villains and... Booster Gold's robot sidekick for some reason. Yeah, because Skeets was like reprogrammed by Thomas Wayne or something. Is that what happened there? It got, yeah, the booster stuff was real dumb. Uh, I'm really glad I checked out on that. Yeah, like I really love Tom King's Batman, but it definitely had some valleys and the Booster Gold arc was the pit. Mm. Uh, unlike you, I like the design. It's it's eh. it's a minimalist re- approach. I think it's cute. I think it's uh, a, a, another option for... I think you're going to see a lot of cosplay out of this. Oh, it, it's it's such a cynically designed, like, it, it feels very factory made. Like, it's trying to get that Harley demo. It feels There's like, no doubt that that's what's going on here. It feels like they want to do classic Harley stuff where, uh, of having the Joker having a gun mall, but they can't do that with Harley anymore because she's had such a arc over the last 20 years defying that. So now they're like, well, we'll make us a new Harley. And, you know, for the character's sake, I hope they do better than that. Realistically, I don't think this character is going to last five years. I don't even think this character is going to last two years. I don't know. I think this will last. And uh, I, I, I'm all about the minimalist approach if it works. Although I, I, I have to completely acknowledge the fact that uh, this is clearly a, a cash grab of some yeah. sort. They're looking to market 
to women fans that loved Harley Quinn and they're trying to double down now. Like Harley, but none of the character. Have we got a bland <laughs> open space for you? Yeah. But uh, she's making her full appearance. I-, I shouldn't say an empty space yet. So far, she's just like a look. But Hell Arisen number three comes out, I think, next week. And that's supposed to be her first full yeah, appearance. Yeah, but how often has a look sold something so hard? It's true. We are in the market of looks, but... Gwenpool? Yeah. Uh, uh, Spider-Gwen? Yeah. We're totally sold yeah, just on a look. Those are superhero costumes. Like, Punchline is essentially just... People clothed with some makeup, which granted was very successful for Harley in the Suicide Squad movie. So I don't know. It, it just feels indicative of a lot of stuff that I'm sick I was of. actually surprised that we don't see more uh, cosplay or attention on um, that one. Uh, the female Joker uh, in White Knight. Oh, uh, Neo Joker. Yes. I don't know. I'm surprised we don't see more of that. I'm also kind of surprised by that with how popular White Knight is. Yeah, and she um, looked great. Yeah, it was a decent design. She had a really good design, much better than punchlines. Yeah. Yeah. But again, uh, now I'm reminded of how much I really hated the, some of the st- story stuff in White Knight. We went in with, 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 the, with the greatest of intentions. We <laughs> thought this was going to be super cool. And yeah, yeah, it was Dis- let down. Disappointing comic. It was. And Batman continues to disappoint me, which sucks because I really love Tom King's Batman. And I hate that we're basically just getting a 15 issue filler arc until Batman 100 rolls around. It's 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 about it's times like this where I'm glad I'm not a Batman fan. And I'm not personally affronted by all this. <laughs> I, I basically I'm just I come in. I look around, see the disaster before me and fade to the darkness. Yeah, it, it's kind of like that for me. I'll jump on a Batman if it's like really spectacular of a creator mm-hmm. who really loves on it. So, and I dipped my head cuz I heard it was a big deal and I was like, "Meh." Okay. Well, but leaving that on. behind, <clears throat> let's go into another bit of disappointment. They did the bad thing. They did the bad thing. We're talking about Flash Forward number 6. Uh, so, <laughs> there's elements of this I like. I really like the why Wally did the things he did this issue. Yes, it's, I, there's, a, there's a level of altruism you can definitely salute, but when it really comes down to it, the writers put him in this situation. So now yeah. we've got Dr. Manhattan Wally. So D- down to he's the got helium a, he's, element on yeah, his head. He's got a blue outfit and he's got the little logo and he's going to fix everything. I really, it does. So I'll say this. It feels true to the arc of the book. This was clearly planned from jump. Mm-hmm. I like the idea of Wally making the ultimate sacrifice to ensure that his kids exist. I think that's really good. I really like that Linda remembers everything now. I love that Jai and Irie are back in continuity. I, I have a I I, I have hope, mm-hmm. which is fun because this is blue and blue is hope. I have hope that this is just a temporary thing. When everything is said and done, Wally's going to be back with his his, his family. He's going to keep the blue outfit, kind of. Or even go back to the red outfit. I'm I'm good with both. <laughs> and then we're gonna have Wally back. The the ideal yeah, the ideal ending for this is Wally has to use all of his power to fix all the problems and then he just comes back yeah, as he, Easter Wally. He, uh, uh, exasperates himself, uh, uh, empties the gas can, you know. Yeah, easily, exactly. Uh, destroys the Mobius chair, which the God <laughs> knows it really needs to happen. Also, it was corny as hell, but I'd really love the uh the, the little the antimatter rod was in you all along, Wally. It was just a representation of your goodness. I was like, that's silly, but I believe. That's that so Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> it was very goofy. Tempest Fusionot is a... Uh, but this is the disappointing the sixth issue to what we were really getting excited about because we thought that there was going to be a new direction for Wally. We just did not want this direction. I knew it was too good. Of, too, it was too much to expect of Scott Lobdell and Brett Booth to it be was. completely satisfied. I, I forgot how much Lob- Lobdell, uh, as I used to pronounce it. I used to disappoint me with X-Men. So Scotty. now he's disappointing me with Wally. And we'll get that free comic book day issue and we'll we'll see how that goes. Yeah, balls. All right. But so I, I will say again, a lot of good in it. Hate the bad thing at the end. So we're going to go into something that you truly love. And yes. I know that you have you have a nerd I boner hate, for our boy Jimmy Olsen. Yes. As I've said many, many, many times, love Jimmy Olsen. He's a top five DC Universe character. Right. Absolutely excellent. Matt Fraction, one of my all-time favorite writers. Steve Lieber, greatest comedy artist alive. Combined on one of my favorite characters is just a dream and Steve project. Steve Lieber is from uh, Superior Foes. Yes, Superior Foes, a Spider-Man. Which is correct. Excellent. Yes. Comedic audience. So here, we open up with a, a excellent homage to the reign of the Superman, 
with four replacement Jimmys, as Jimmy Olsen has throughout the series been faking as his death. As you called it, Jimmy's Olsen. Yes, Jimmy's Olsen's. And you have like a uh, you have a cyborg Olsen who is obsessed with his web presence. He thanks he, he thanks his his uh, I'm gonna say victims those he sa- the people he saves he thanks them for their likes and subscribes. Uh, there is the Olsen of Steel, who is just a steel statue of Jimmy it's Olsen that gets around carted from around place from place to place. There is the uh, totally radical Olsen, who is completely relevant. Stay <laughs> radical he, and relevant. He roller skates around, has CDs falling out of his pockets. <laughs> I didn't see that part. That's actually pretty cool. And then the uh, the supermodel Olsen, who's like, he's a bodyguard. He's the eradicator of the big old... Uh, Hitman Heart Shades. Oh, yes. The wraparounds. <laughs> Who uh, turns out just be two kids in a Jimmy suit. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> it's a great little bit t- labeled my Olsen, my Olsen, my Olsen and me. <laughs> so I, I found out in this issue that Jimmy Olsen is, in fact, married. Yes. Has visited Gorilla City many, many times. times. <laughs> and apparently his lady love, his wife, I should say, is a crime fighter. Uh, she no, she's not a crime fighter. So why is she masked? She's a space thief. <laughs> yeah. Even so better in the Leviathan one shot that started off uh, this Jimmy Olsen run. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jimmy wakes up in Gorilla City after a book signing, having had a wild evening that ended up with him getting Gorilla City married to Gorilla a space City thief married. who takes off and is like, "All right, just don't forget to get our marriage annulled." But he did, and so when she was being as part of a heist planning to marry a space conqueror, he found out that she was still married. And so he started making his way to Earth. So she had to beat him to it to get the marriage annulled. It's very good. Stuff. Is that the part where they're going back and forth and she's trying to find out just how many times he's been to Gorilla yes. City? It's a bit because she's like, remember the last time you're in Gorilla City? And it does a goofy cutaway gag to uh, our cover with Big Jim. <laughs> Wrapped <laughs> right with Metamorpho. On a, uh, on a King Kong spree against Enemy Ape, which... Amazing visual pun. They don't label him as enemy ape, but it's it's enemy it's ace. Yeah, it's, it's very clear. It's a gorilla enemy is, ace. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and he mentions like, yeah, it was the last time in Gorilla City. It made it made the news. It was on CNN. Well, Gorilla CNN, which <laughs> made me absolutely lose my. <laughs> we have this panel of just a gorilla talking head saying, "Ook ook 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 ook." <laughs> <laughs> I died at that bit. Oh my god. And, I, I, and she asks him, how many times do you go to Gorilla City? And in a response that I felt in my soul, Jimmy says, it's a city full of gorillas. I go all the time. <laughs> so, yes, uh, apparently Jimmy Olsen is a and I, I love the fact that it's still got the old stamp Superman's pal yes. above it. And they play with that a lot in the uh, in, in uh, the narration boxes. They'll do little riffs on it like Superman's post hummus pal, Jimmy Olsen. <laughs> oh, jeez. So back in the 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 seventies, actually, and in the late sixties, Jimmy Olsen has his own title. This is back during the the the, the checkerboard era of uh, DC, where they would put checkers mm-hmm. across the top, and you they had a quality, Jimmy Olsen title the that was called checks. Superman's Pal Jimmy Olsen. But it was usually Jimmy Olsen getting into trouble and Superman coming to rescue, getting him. wild transformations, turning into Turtle Boys. Yeah, essentially, it was a Superman book, but you know, <laughs> a different flavor. And this is also where Turtle Boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, came from and the, the other variety of uh, and the uh, most probably the most important thing about two ranch foul Jimmy Olsen is uh, when Jack Kirby went over to DC he famously asked put me on your lowest selling book and I'll make it your highest selling book and so they slapped him on <laughs> two ranch pal Jimmy Olsen and that's where he introduced dark side. Is that where it Dark is? Side's first appearance is an issue of Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen on a little computer screen talking to the aliens that are causing shenanigans in the book. What an underwhelming introductory. There's also an issue where uh, a scientist grows a little planet and in the sky he projects horror movies. So everyone on the planet, little planet evolves into little Draculas and little <laughs> Frankensteins and mummies. And the way uh, Jimmy and Superman save the day is they switch the real to Westerns. And since time goes by faster, they go down and now they're all like vampire cowboys. <laughs> oh, my God. That's hilarious. I am. I am so Star Trek. I am a Jimmy Olsen aficionado and Jack Kirby's run is. God, so that, that reminds me of the space Nazis from the old <laughs> Star Trek series. Remember that? Or a piece of the action? Yes. 
the where uh captain kirk finds a planet where it's their entire society is based off of like a, a visual dictionary about gangsters yeah well i was i saw a meme today where it's basically spock uh, leaning over and he sees two nazis being the crap out of somebody he goes oh, shit. space nazis <laughs> it's like that's great that was the episode yeah i gotta watch that now uh. But PC yes. Action was a really good episode. Not not to get too off on a tangent, but PC Action is an excellent Star Trek episode. Captain, what are heaters? Yes. <laughs> he had to wear the hat to cover his ear tips. So yeah. good. I remember when I was a kid seeing that episode and when Kurt goes, a piece of the action. I was like, hey, that's the title of the episode. Hey, that's very that on the, That was the first time. I'm going to notice one of those shout outs. All right. So this next bit, uh, this next bit's been in the, on the cook for quite some time over at Marvel uh, mm-hmm. because of a, a podcast called yeah. Marvel Voices about uh, minority creators mm-hmm. and uh, and their, well, and minority creations, I guess we could call it. Um, this was actually a big deal. Um, There's a lot of uh, a lot of great stuff that's actually been written about this. A lot of um, corresponding essays from the website mm-hmm. that ask you, hey, if you if you if, when you're reading the comic, check out some of the essays on some of the, the stuff that we did on this one. Um, I I. I got through the entire issue. I didn't get a chance to really dig into all of the essays because mm-hmm. I had a lot of stuff to read, unfortunately. Um, but I really like this. I really like what they did with this. Yeah, I, I love me a good anthology, and this was quite a fun one. Uh, obviously, we're not going to talk about every single story in it because... No, we really can't. There's a lot of one-shots in there that really, you know, okay, that's a nice one yeah. page about she hole busting somebody out. And it's like, okay, that's great. Um uh, I, I, of course, love the what you termed as the wacky races yes, with uh, Vida Yala <laughs> and Bernard Chang doing a, a Forge and Shuri race. Yes. Or Forge has a gross looking bio car from Yes, from he, he did. It's like, oh, I should have put uh, heat shielding on this one. I knew. <laughs> I, uh, what did what, what, you leave space for in a heat shield? It's like, I needed an espresso machine in there. <laughs> Ah, so good. So that, that was great. Um, I but the, 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 the thing that really caught my attention uh, was the um, the spread that uh, uh, Lucio Vecchio did, mm-hmm. uh, which brought back Stryker from Avengers Academy. Yes. And I was like, wow, I haven't seen him in so long. Now, the, when I'm looking at this, am I right to assume that uh, Vecchio did uh, Stryker in Avengers Academy? Mm, I don't was he be- part of the creative team I don't team believe there? so. I don't think he was. Because it really felt like that was the way it was drawn. I don't believe so. I might be wrong, but I don't think... I don't think he was like working on main books at that point. This may be just me, my, my bad research on this yeah. one, but uh, it was clear that Stryker is a favorite because uh, he is like front and center uh, mm-hmm. during this little bit. And I was like, Rita's was like, oh, hey, cool. It, it's a it's a spread from all the, the, the queer heroes. Yeah. And I was like, wow, there's a bunch of stuff on here. My credibility is feeling tasked. I better start naming all these. So I spent like like a day. Going through all of this and try and name everything and and asking you for help occasionally. Mm-hmm. And when it really came down to it, I was still five short on what I could name. Which is still pretty damn good because they, they managed to pack that page in. They really did. There was like a, a tiny little frame of a guy wearing a red mask. I'm like, who the hell could that possibly be? That's Pyro 2. <laughs> like, I had no idea that Pyro 2, one, wore a red mask and two, was gay. Um, but and I, there was like... On the very far, if I'm looking at the page, if I'm looking down at the page, on the very far right, up in the sky, there's a a, a, a gentleman in a, a silk shirt with glowing hands. I have no idea who that is. I still don't know who that is. We'll solve it eventually. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I actually had to reach out to uh, uh, Vecchio himself, which was surprisingly easy to approach on his uh, Facebook page. Yeah. He's super active on Twitter as well. Yeah, I looked at his Twitter page and his redesigns for X, uh, X-Men Storm and Iceman were really yeah, good. Yeah, he does. He is always posting incredible sketches like that. I love his costume work. Uh, his Polaris design is one of my favorites of all time. I, I didn't get a chance to check out the Polaris one, but I, I saw that he was a big fan of the X-Factor redesigns. And that was which definitely puts him in good taste. Good taste. Very good taste. Um so I, I I actually reached out. I was like, hey, listen, I really want to get the, the names for all this because I want to do a thing about it. So obviously I'm going to show a picture of here of the big spread of the entire page. You got all the various heroes. I'm also going to give you a little bit of time to look at. Well, this might be hard to look at the screen. So I'm obviously going to have to put this in our uh, link rooney down below. Yeah, indeed. So uh, Vicky provided me or us, I should say. 
uh, with a page that showcases all the names that are involved mm-hmm. in there. Um, I, I was I, 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 I had to personally pat myself on the back because I, I was able to name some real dark horses in this one, like uh, Dark Veil. Who would ever thought that would have popped up again? <laughs> I was uh, I was actually really surprised. Just I was thinking about it and it was like, I remember when they were introduced, they were called Shade. And I was like, that's pretty great. Quality drag pun. Love it. But then I was <laughs> and then they later changed their name to Dark Veil. And they I was preferred to be called Dark. Veil I kind of yes. was confused by that. I was like, but Shade was such a good name. And Dark Veil sounds like a generic 90s character name. But then I was thinking today, I was like, I wonder if it has anything to do with the existence of Shade the Changing Man over at DC. And that if like the name Shade is so closely like tied to a different superhero, if they wanted to get away from that connotation. DC too, which was a Green Arrow villain. Oh, no, that's Shadow. It was, oh, okay. Yeah, that's an O. I always get that mixed up. Yeah, there is a shade, shade the changing girl and later shade the changing woman, mm-hmm. but they're obviously tied to the shade the changing man continuity. Yeah, when all is said and done, there was like uh, forty some odd characters squeezed yeah. into this one page. Dude, that's like, that's a Herculean effort. Uh, my, my hat's off to you. Yeah, seriously. Say, <laughs> if you have, if you follow any comic artists, you know that the greatest bane of any artist is having to draw a crowd shot, unless you're George Perez or Phil Jimenez. Oh, like George Perez is a that. true crowd master. <laughs> Oh God! Jay I really wish you could draw baby. again. I, I I truly miss George Perez. I know he can't pull that stuff off anymore. Not not with any level of regularity yeah. anymore. It's too um, bad. He is truly one of the greatest living comic artists. Oh, I I still have what his old uh, Avengers uh, poster that he did like in the mid nineties. Oh, the one with all of them and wasps around the border. Yes, oh, I love that. Uh, such a great poster. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah. Um. Thanks for that spread, Vecchio. Seriously. Uh, I hope you get a chance to actually yeah, see this episode. And it's a super cool issue. I highly recommend picking it up just yeah. for all the fun tidbits throughout. I actually hope that this actually opens the door for more from uh, Marvel Voices because this is an ongoing podcast. Mm-hmm. I would love to see more stuff from this. Yeah. Let's get that Marvel Voices number two, Marvel. Yeah. All right. Next up we got is Runaways number 30. Uh, now... In this, basically, the Runaways are still uh, in L.A. They're still doing the L.A. thing with, uh, I think it's Captain Justice. Mm -hmm. Doc Justice. Doc Justice. Thank you. That's how much I really remember this thing I just read. Uh, And they're basically living out the lives or the costumes of previous sidekicks that Doc Justice has had. And they're out doing their missions, but at the same time, leaving poor Gertie and uh, former Doc Justice Jr., I believe, uh, Brian, uh, back at the place, overlooking stuff, you know, basically pulling an oracle. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we finally find out what was pretty much we figured out long before this whole thing started is that Doc Justice has been using the deaths of his previous sidekicks as a way to promote his brand. And he's got an algorithm for how it, it does. You know, it's like a level of mourning, likability, all this other stuff. D- does he resort to a phone poll to decide who lives yeah, and who it, dies? It gets real dark really quick. And so Gertie's like, well, crap, I don't I, I, I got to reach out to somebody. So she quickly reaches out to uh, Wilder. Uh, but she gets Wilder's voicemail. She goes, oh, it's not like you're going to pick up on this anyway, which I hope is really foreshadowing. I hope Alex Wilder truly comes in and saves the day on this one because I am an Alex Wilder fan. I do like me some Alex Wilder. He's my favorite runaway. Uh, and But she's stopped by Brian and a pistol. <sighs> so that's what's going on right now with this. I, I loved this turn, even though I did see it coming a mile away. Um, I, I want to see just how how dark it's really going to get because um, I didn't realize just how many heroes they've gone through, but Carolina Dean is like the fifth iteration of fallen angel. Good Lord. So they've cranked out quite a number of children <laughs> into the grave for this. Um, and I really kind of see what I, I really, I'm really excited to see Superheroes where it's going. Just different on the West coast. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> no one's paying attention to all these dead sidekicks, man. It's, it's all a kid miracle man all over again. <laughs> But uh, moving right along to our weekly X coverage, and we start with the inevitable Wolverine number one. Man, show that awesome cover. Woo, that sweet, sweet chip kid that variant is cover. A sweet, sweet cover. So this is like, uh, we got twice the size on this one because we yes. got two stories going on. Yet, yeah, your first taste. So they're both written by Benjamin Percy of X Force mm-hmm. with uh, Adam Kubert taking the A story and Victor Bogdanovic taking the B story. I was more invested in the B story, I gotta say. B story was pretty fun. I. I don't know. 
there I like them for different reasons. I like how tightly the A story is tied in to Hawks and Pox stuff mm-hmm. with the uh Krakoan, with the the cheap imitation Krakoan drugs. Mm-hmm. And but that said, Wolverine fighting vampires in the B story. Yeah. Which I, I loved it back during uh, Fall of the Mutants when uh, Blade and Wolverine were fighting like, things. How long? How long until my man Eric Eric Brooks shows up? Yeah, exactly. And that was that was the storyline that uh, uh, vampified Jubilee for yes. years. I uh, I cannot say that Curse of the Mutants is a good story, but it is a fun as hell story. Oh yeah, it absolutely was. You got Cyclops telling Dracula to follow his heart and then decapitating him. <laughs> <laughs> I was all about it because I'm a huge Blade fan, and mm-hmm. I thought that just putting Blade in this, of course, there were uh, Marvel was a little disingenuous with their promotion of this, implying heavily that Blade was going to join the X Men, which didn't happen. I mean, he's not mute. He's, he was a guest star. He's a vampire. Yeah, but still, that's what Sp- they were heavily implied. Spidey's on the cover of the issue after it. <laughs> and you know, they heavily implied that he was joining the X Men too. Go back and look at the ads for these things. I, I remember I was reading X Men at the time. Misleading. <laughs> Uh, but I was still invested in it because it showed uh, what uh, Wolverine's uh, his uh, healing factor, how it reacts to the mm-hmm. vampification. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, it vamps up yeah. uh, Jubilee, which I was OK with. You know, it's OK. She was she had lost eh. her powers around that time. This is right after her stint with the uh, new, new warriors, warriors where yeah. she was wearing uh, that that suit to give her abilities, which I wasn't crazy about that era either. I liked some of it. Uh, I didn't like the fact that they practically off screen killed off like three characters. Yeah. Beak be- wearing a vulture suit was funny, though. I got a, I always get a good chuckle yeah. out of that. But I was uh, a little upset by that, but I'm glad that they've actually went back and brought those characters back. Me too. Yeah. I But back to Wolverine number one. So the A story, you've got Logan investigating some folks who have been stealing the Krakoan, the Krakoan flowers and making a drug, a street drug called Pollen. And meanwhile, there is a detective who's got giving me major, uh, major Hopper vibes. Also investigating. So. You know what he also feels like to me? The hmm. dude. Yeah. It's like it's it, like if the dude and Hopper put on the shirt from that guy from G.I. Joe. Oh, uh, Chuckles. Chuckles. He's yeah. got Chuckles shirt. One of the few Joes I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's got a daughter who has some disease. I don't remember if they specify or not. Uh, it seemed like it was cancer. Yeah. It implied cancer. and. So she needs those sweet, sweet Cohen drugs to keep her alive. Exactly. Well, actually to save her life. Yeah. But some fools are out there stealing the Cohen drugs and making pollen. Yep. And so obviously he and Logan's paths will cross. I think they cross the very, very end of the story. Mm-hmm. They meet up out in the Alaskan desert, Alaska, Alaskan tundra, not desert at all. And uh, after Logan wakes up, having seemingly killed all of his friends. And he looks screwed up. Oh, yeah. He is. That like, was great. Yeah. He was like skeletal. Yeah. It's like my bones are on the shout outside. Out, shout out to Adam Kuber. He's been drawing Logan for years, but it's never been this gnarly. Yeah, it, it was pretty rowdy. Uh, I, I began to wonder if that was actually in direct relation to the time he got cut in half. Mm-hmm. But then again, he was put back yeah. together. And uh, I really like that they tie in his first appearance in the Dawn of X era when in House of X number one, when he's you see him playing hide and seek with the little mutant kids. Mm-hmm. I remember being like, huh, Wolverine just had a silent cameo in this first issue and he's just playing with kids. Adorable. I love it. Yeah, that was back when we were talking about the fact that Wolverine was not getting a lot of coverage. He was yeah. definitely in the back well, yeah, yeah, of the uh, background. He's in three books regularly now. <laughs> yeah, we're back to Wolverine <laughs> status quo. And uh, yeah, the, the Bogdanovic story in the back with the vampires. Uh, not a ton to say on it. Like it was, it was fun. But the okay. big thing for me, though, is that scene where the vampires have Wolverine strung up and they stick a spigot in his neck. Oh, that yeah. was great. And that definitely keyed in the old animal thing. <laughs> I like that because it brought back Omega Red. Um, it kind of, unfortunately, got rid of a lot of the character development that Omega Red went yeah. through during uh, Weapon X-Force, which I've brought up at least a dozen times. You can take your shots now. Yes, because this is <laughs> this, this is my saber tooth complaint. Uh, was it also translates to now my Omega Red complaint. Well, he actually did get some character development. Omega Red doesn't have to be in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, I know. It's like he's not in the hole, and my boy is still sitting in there rotting. I'm still upset he left about a, that. Left a trunk full of dead kids. Uh, I mean, saber that tooth. was the vampires. The vampires, the dead kids. Man, saber tooth got a raw deal. He did. Don't he, worry, they'll, they'll let him off the leash. He eventually. needs that 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 stone lawyer. He needs a stone's lawyer. To get out of there. <laughs> We're gonna cut that stuff in half. Oh, I don't want my uh, client in a deep dark hole. I want him in a deep dark hole with a beer fridge. And 
ESPN. One window. <laughs> one window. <laughs> why, why won't this do a uh, medium level, medium level but with visitation? I'm honestly a little mad that this book was as good as it is because the last thing I need is more books to read. But damn it. Uh, good time. Yes, I know. This is the this is the bad thing when Marvel or DC starts getting on a run of really good stuff, which usually happens in the summertime, mm-hmm. and you feel bogged down. Yep. And then you got that nice, oh hey, I'm just gonna let my books sit for a while. Come back, come back next week. You got two hundred dollars worth of books to deal with. The good news is with the uh, the Empire event starting up soon, which I have very little interest in, I'll be able to skip quite a few titles. So <laughs> Woo! we'll still cut. Co- we'll still be covering Empire. Yeah, but- we're gonna cover it. We're just not gonna buy it. <laughs> No, we will pay for our comics that we read. We pay for the comics that we read, but we're not going to be invested. Yeah, emotionally invested. Yes. All right. I'm, I'm going to review my comics. I'm just going to stand in a comic book store and just go. Okay, I'm going to review a, this. That's a good way to not get invited back to a comic book store. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll do it to several comic books. As an it's employee all who needs to sell books, don't do that. Don't do that, people. It's really annoying. Yeah, yeah. It's not a library. Seriously. Buy the damn thing. Okay. (laughs) But moving right along, Marauders number eight. We know the fate of one character. Yeah. Lockheed's okay. He's eaten. Yeah, he's eaten. Got a little bit of fire coming out of him, but Bishop finds our girl, Kate. Yeah. And uh, White Queen doesn't take it very well. No, she and Storm have a really good scene together, though. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. It was, yeah. It really tells me that that, the the scene that that White Queen had with Kate was genuine. Mm Mm-hmm. And I really like that because I hate it when a writer gets a hold of Emma and then turns her into a one note bitch. Yeah. Because that's shallow as hell. I hate that kind of crap. I hate it. And if there's anybody that's gone through the ringer and has gotten her some decent development, it's Emma Frost. Oh, my God. Yeah. Ever since like uh, the Hellions died, it's just been better, oh God, better, better, yeah. better. The Hellions died and then uh, everybody in uh, Generation Genosha, A. She, I was going to say, Gen X kids before that, and then Genosha hits. Oh, God. She has had a rough run, especially since it was her sister that killed Sink. Yeah. Mm. I think that Frost herself internally knows that she has a lot to atone for. Yeah. But at the same time, she has a a, a, a facade, bravado. a yeah. mask to maintain. It's really, that's a big reason that Emma is one of my favorite X characters and one of my favorite comic book characters, period. And you know, I'll still say right now, to this day, the Emma Frost miniseries is one of the best ones out there. It's a really good book that no one read because it's got some pretty terrible misleading covers. It really does. They're all highly sensualized paintings of of her in various stages of X-Men undress. But really came down to it. It was an empowering book about Emma Frost and how she grew yeah, up and became who she was. I'd say it's a coming of age story about a teenage girl like finding her place in the world. And you find out that Emma Frost is actually a brunette. Mm hmm. Plot twist. All right. (laughs) But anyways, Marauders, always good. I'm still not totally sold on Kitty being 100% dead. Neither are they, if you notice. It's like, we're going to get her back one way or another. They're just, you know, there's that level of uncertainty because she doesn't have that connection to Krakoa. And I'm very excited for the the tease for next issue with uh, when we get Yellow Jacket uh, wrecking havoc. Inside and outside of Pyro. Uh, we, I, I think we also need to mention about what happens when Iceman is angry. Oh, man, that was oh. that was dark. Woo. OK, so Iceman found the ship that uh, apparently housed whoever killed Kate Pride. He doesn't know it was Sebastian Shaw, mm-hmm. but he definitely got in Sebastian Shaw's ship and he found some soldiers here. So he's like, yeah, it's Genosha Law. I'm not going to kill you definitely gonna maim you yeah like <laughs> he gives them some terrible case of frostbite he freezes limbs and chops them off yeah so there's a funny thing about frostbite is it, it just never goes away it's a pain that will be there forever i'm gonna and all of you are gonna get some of this yeah. he, he knocks the guy's trigger finger off and he cuts off the guy's arm yeah bobby drake was taking no prisoners in that yeah it was, i don't even want to call it a fight it was just a slaughter no no it was it was definitely one-sided it but was definitely one-sided one more thing i want to say about marauders I really love uh, Sebastian's choice in Black Knights. Fenris. Yes. Everyone's favorite messes. They're reunited. No longer does uh, oh, Andreas have to have a sword with the skin of his dead sister anymore. During Thunderbolts, and I know this because I'm a Thunderbolts fan, there was a character called Swordsman. It was revealed later that Swordsman was uh, Andreas Strucker. And the way the Fenris works is their 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 abilities uh, are at their peakest when they pull the old uh, Aurora Northstar technique. You know, they they touch and 
boom, everything just got, goes nuts. In case nuts. you thought the subtext with Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch was too subtle. Yeah. So here when, we have uh, incestuous Nazi twins. So when one of the incestuous Nazi twins, specifically Andreas Trucker, gets killed, um, Andreas leathers her skin. And then use it to wrap a sword hilt with, so he's able to use the full so capacity do that, of his the powers. The Legend of Zelda sword shoot. Yeah. <laughs> and then part of the whole thing he was trying to do this is because Zemo promises that he can clone Andreas Strucker. <laughs> well, doesn't need to now. Go, baby. Yep. <laughs> Fenris is back. She was actually brought back as a clone for a while. Oh, man, I didn't I'm see pretty that. sure that they just killed that clone off and started fresh. <laughs> and I was like, all right, go now, back. See, now I want her to come back eventual. No, I, I think I what want, they have right now is the real deal. Yeah, they I say, have the what clone. I'm saying is I want the clone to come back with a vengeance. Uh, I'll pull a Madeline Pryor. Yes. Uh, I think it's going to be hey. a little too... Uh, I don't think anybody's going to remember that clone. I think we're no, probably the only two people who are going to remember that clone. But that's the fun thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, on our last book for the week, New Mutants number seven, it's another Jonathan Hickman and Rod Reyes joint. And this, this t- book <laughs> killed me. This time, during our regular recaps from Sunspot, he accidentally covers an issue that hasn't happened yet. Yep. Basically <laughs> jumping New Moon's one issue up. And, and, and <laughs> Danny Moonstar calls him out on it. And he's like, well, look, you look at the numbers. Like the last issue was five and then there's six and now we're on seven. And she's yeah. like, yeah, we're swapping off the story with the other, with the other New Mutants. Like, we're, you, just- you mean that there's New Mutant stories where I'm not in it? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Hey, Bobby, because soon the two stories will connect once these new mutants return to so Earth. So basically, Bobby and Danny completely destroy the fourth wall Deadpool style. And it was hilarious. It's a great little bit of Absolutely cartooning, hilarious. too. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm glad that the new mutants has slowly become one of the uh, mutant uh, humor books. Mm-hmm. Because it's bringing back a humanity to the book that I've always wanted. Oh, yeah. And I hope they keep this going. Because <laughs> it is kind of ridiculous. I love... Uh, Late, uh, later on in the well, a little bit after that when we get to the big fight scene instead of giving you the actual <laughs> fight scene the text one of the text pieces for this book is a quick d6 based game <laughs> called fight and we you, could spread this out for another 17 pages but instead get yourself a d6 and sort it out yourself just a, just a game of elimination <laughs> and i mean the the fight ends in a draw anyway yeah, so uh, which is the do. point so after you spend all that time making your own results it doesn't wind up mattering and it was and really apparently some weird ongoing joke with wolfsbane where she seems to be licking the glass of everything that she sees dogs like glass uh, is that what that's all yeah. about is that the shtick you ever see a dog press his face against the glass oh. it's hilarious like, what, what can you do i could do this orb of light lick 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 cool does she really think i'm cool no i don't think she's she cool <laughs> But I think next up for the New Mutants is they're going to show up in X-Men pretty soon. Like, they're heading back to Earth, and we're going to get... There's that and they have their own ship now, the Deathbird, because yes. Bobby has found yet again for the 13th time that he's in love oh, with Deathbird. And he buys uh, Sam's apartment building so he can hang out there and also yeah, be on, near on, Deathbird. like the Shire homeworld. <laughs> uh, well, so, you know, they, they make this big deal like, oh, God, you know, we're going to leave you here and all this other stuff. But, man, they got Cohen Gateways. They can come yeah. and go as they please. They plant run right there. Yeah, Sam could literally come to Krakoa and have lunch and then go back to the Shire homeworld. Pretty good deal. Because apparently those gateways have like Lila Cheney levels of range on them. I liked Mondo pulling the flowers. He's like, all right, someone find a place so I can plant this. Oh, yeah, that's crazy. That, that old hole he's got in his. Oh, it's so gross. Just, just a little hole in the tongue. I like the fact that they completely throw shade on the Gen Xers. Oh, it's like, hey, we're going to just pull these uh, do nothing Gen Xers while they complain about the the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to be stuck out there in space. No. I love that bit in the issue before where uh, uh, where Jono and Mondo are just like, hey, you, you want to get involved in this? Nah, they got nah, it. We could totally sit it out. <laughs> and I like the fact I like that they did that because that leaves the whole book for the real new mutants and not these. These two tag alongs yeah. that have really no business the, being in a book. The real old mutants. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I know we've gone back and forth about the whole title of New Mutants, but it has to remain the New Mutants, man. That's the nostalgia. They should be the X-Men. No, I should firm, be the New Mutants. Firmly in Chris Claremont's they, camp. Danny even says we're called the New Mutants. New old Although mutants. it was kind of eh, <laughs> continuity, but... Uh, but let's take a quick break before we get to our news, because we got some big old bombshells. Yep. <laughs> 
Hey, this is Brooke with Haphazard Fiction Studios, and you are listening to episode 24 of Hazardous Materials, last week's comics this week. Hopefully you guys are enjoying the episode this week. We are continuing to try to improve the uh, the recording studio, the content, everything that we do for you guys. Um, so we do really just ask if you guys have any input, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Uh, you can message us on Facebook or, or Instagram or tweet us. Uh, you can send us messages through the Haphazard Fiction website. Uh, just anything that you guys have for us, you know, but give us a subscribe, give us a like, share us with your friends. You know, we, we definitely are uh, wanting to get as many people tuned in as possible. And, you know, nothing better than a good recommendation from uh, other comic book fans out there. But we do thank you guys for tuning in to us this week. And I take you back now to Casey and Gideon with Hazardous Materials. And we are back with our uh, first big piece of news. This actually just came out like a couple hours before we started recording that a uh, publisher, co-publisher of DC Comics, Dan Dio, is no longer the co-publisher of DC Comics. Yeah, no, absolutely no warning. No, hey, I might be doing this. Hey, I might be retiring. Just outright said, I'm out. Yeah. Peace. No news on whether it was his decision or a decision made above him. But yeah, this is At nuts. this level, uh, this level of abruption. Yeah, uh, there has to be bad tidings on on one side or another. Yeah, I'm. Idadio didn't apparently didn't like something and said screw that, or Deesa said you're out. Yeah, I'm concerned. So, Dan Didio has a pretty complicated legacy. I'm not the biggest fan of a lot of his editorial decisions. He famously had a lot of issues with Fifty Two as it was coming out, which is one of the greatest comics of the 2000s, and said Countdown, which is not one of the greatest comics of the 2000s was 52 done right uh he's mostly responsible for the new 52 which i'll allow you to fill in your own blanks on that one uh does not like the teen titans at all does not like legacy characters is he the reason why the teen titans got canceled on cartoon network i mean probably not that was probably a cartoon network decision still <laughs> yeah still upset about that uh but if you like characters like Dick Grayson or Wally West, probably not a big fan of Dan DiDio. That son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that said, he's gone to bat for some good risky series like all of Mark Russell's DC work, which I absolutely love. Um, a lot of a lot of pros have a ton of great stuff to say about the guy. Also, some have some negative stuff to say about the guy. But I'm curious to see what DC's new direction is going to be, because especially because. Uh, the big rumored 5G shakeup, that was Dan DiDio's baby. That was him really pushing that. And so with him gone, I'm curious to see what the direction of the company is going to be. I honestly don't know. And yeah. I don't know who could fill in those shoes. Not immediately. I, I feel like the easy bingo answer is Jeff Johns. You just feel like a monkey's paw for me. Mm, God, you know what? I just find that Jeff Johns is, is better suited writing comics. I, I like him when he's writing smaller comics, more niche characters. Green Lantern's about as big as a name as I want Jeff Johns writing. Uh, he did great in uh, Aquaman. A, Aquaman's a smaller name than Green Lantern, I'd say. Well, no, Aquaman's bigger. Yeah. Aquaman's the biggest name I want Jeff Johns. To, well, no, I like his Superman, you know? Yeah. Don't like his Doomsday Clock, though. Not a fan of The Flash. I love his Wally West Flash stuff. Oh, yeah. I despise all, most of his Barry stuff. Well, that's because we all think that Barry is Snoozeville. He's got some, he does some good bits for Barry, but there's just not enough of meat on a character there. There really isn't. Barry has not had enough, which is really strange for a character that came straight out of the 60s. Really comes down to it. There's really nothing to Barry. No, he's a blank, he and Ray Palmer just blank slates. Yeah, I mean, he's brave. He did the whole shtick in 85 with the Christ and Infinite yeah, and, and that sacrificed was great. himself. Should have let him go out on a high note. Yeah, uh, well, they and they did. He was gone for 20 years. Yeah. I, I think by the time he came back, well, he'd been the Flash longer than Barry had. Yeah. Which, wild. He did. He did that. Uh, uh, guest star and Quasar. Yeah, buried, buried alien. alien. Yeah. That's good stuff. That was great. But definitely some uh, tumultuous times ahead for Detective Comics comics. Mm. Say with, with Jim yeah, Lee, Detective Comics comics. You're right. Yeah. You see, with Jim Lee as the lone publisher, how, how long will our heroes safe from more Nehru collars and lines? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think that the DC's going to act fast because they've got some face to save. 
Especially if this is Tadayo's choice. Yeah. And I wonder how quiet he's going to be about it. I'm also very curious about what's going to happen with his Metalman series that's going on right now. Because that's only on issue like number four or five out of 12. <sighs> Will it get wrapped up? Who knows? We'll see. How amicable is this exit? I, I'm, I'm Find curious. Out this next is week. definitely, yeah, this is, if anybody is, is kind of wondering about this, you know, there's some of you that know more about Marvel and more about DC. This is like if Kevin Feige just decided to jump ship today, just out of the blue. That would that would melt faces. That yeah. would melt brains. That would show up in entertainment tonight. On, on not one, so much with this. On the one hand, <laughs> I'm sad to see the man who oversaw Blackest Night go. Happy to see the guy who oversaw Identity Crisis go. <laughs> Truth. Truth. I, I can't argue with that one. Um, Dan, let's make Wally West a murderer. Studio. Bitch. Well, best of luck to him. Yeah, so we got uh, a new Spider-Man series coming out. Uh, by uh, what, what, what's, what's the writer? Joe Kelly Joe and Kelly. Chris Pacello, two creatives who I'll try out anything they do. Yeah. Pacello, I will buy anything that man draws. I, 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 love I remember stuff. Uh, Joe Kelly's Deadpool run. Yes, was excellent. And I'm also a big fan of a Superman run from the early 2000s. Which yeah, yeah, him and McGinnis got right off of Deadpool and right on Superman. Yeah, that's right. He did do McGinnis with Deadpool, didn't he? Yep, yep. That's where I was. How that McGinnis was, that got was back his when, big push. When Wade was a little. A little beefier. Oh, yeah. T-Ray, <laughs> a mountain of a man. Oh, God, that's right. They did the T-Ray story with the, the Band-Aid across the nose and everything please, like that. Please, please, Marvel, give me give me T-Ray in Deadpool 3. Give me the real Wade Wilson. We don't need T-Ray. I love T-Ray. I hated T-Ray. <laughs> Deadpool's best villain. So his worst villain. But, like, Deadpool's got good villains. <laughs> <laughs> we had some, I'm sure. T-Ray. Ajax, what an all-timer. Remember his <sighs> stupid blue costume? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, what, what, what Slayback? Was that his name? Slayback? Oh, Lord. <laughs> You're not helping your case. T- <laughs> like, if nothing else, T Ray's the best of a bad bunch. He really, yeah, he's, he's the leader of the bad bunch. He's the leader of the DC version. No, not say DC version. You know what? T Ray could be with the Nasty Boys. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Bring him back. <laughs> I'm waiting for my Don of X Nasty Boys. Man, how long has Don of X been around and not a single member of the Nasty Boys has shown up? Where is Hairbag? Yeah, no kidding. Where is Slab? Watch them show up in Hellions. That's where you're probably going to see the Nasty Boys. I was going to pick up Hellions number one because I'm getting all the number ones. And then they showed that Maddie Pryor is going to be a number two. I was like, damn, he got me for number two. Mm -hmm. The Nasty Boys are number three. That's three for three. That's true. Oh, oh, God. You know what we totally forgot about? Hmm. The Bar Sinister. Oh man, yeah, we get more sinister secrets. Yes, so scandalous. <laughs> it's like somebody needs a cape. <laughs> ah. So I, I, I totally forgot about this, but I think it's in the end of it's. Is it the end of Marauders? It's in Marauders. Or is it, it's in Marauders. Uh, but Mister Sinister's uh, scandalous. Uh, let me uh, uh, let me do a dramatic reading for these. Yeah, his scandalous uh, rumors rag uh, <laughs> comes out though. The bar sinister or the red diamond. Here we go. Sinister secret number 16, shade for one, I respect the power move, but come on, if I can make a meeting, anyone can. Come on, Kay. Sinister secret number 17, waitlisted by Jumbo, a few of my thirsty patrons quenching thirst have been quizzical about a certain quirky cue that can't quite catch his quarry. We hear he's blaming his wardrobe. It does make the man. Perhaps it's time for a fabulous cape. Sinister secret number 18, make more mutants, they said. Now, be honest, who did you have crossing the finish line first? Probably a pretty redhead or a blonde. Well, nobody got this one right. Congrats to former wild child stinger. Good luck with that baby bump. If the kid turns out to be interesting, bring him by Krakoa. Seek answer secret number 19. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who are the grossest mutants of them all? No, not the Morlocks. Don't put you down, muties. Well, it's not for me to say, but keep your eyes on a swivel. You may spot them when you think you're seeing double. Ugh. Of course it's Fenris. Gross. Can't spell Von Strucker without the suck. If only knew anyone in the Quiet Council suggests get, growing a new cocoa and leaving them on it. <laughs> <laughs> so Great apparently he's not mixing his words about his opinion, uh, opinions on Fenris, which is hilarious. Yeah. Incest Nazi twins. That's very true. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So for those that haven't put two and two together on poor Fenris, these are the children of Baron Wolfgang Von Strucker, which you saw in the very beginnings of uh, Age, uh, of Age of Ultron. Where it says, never surrender. Okay, I'm going to surrender. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I like Baron Strucker quite a bit as a old school Hydra is explicitly a Nazi organization. 
And he had his devil's claw. Mm-hmm. He had the Nazi gold that Magneto and Charles no, 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 had their it, first man, team up. It was up. the Satan's claw. The Satan's claw, sorry. I once saw an issue of uh, um, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., the old Steranko mm-hmm. issues. And he's fighting against um, uh, Von Strucker when he's in the green yeah. Hydra. And he's got his Satan's claw literally <laughs> stuffed in the back of his pants. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking out like this big end of the gauntlet out of his Speedo. It's the funniest thing Sometimes I've ever seen. Sometimes you gotta seen. have it ready to go. But yeah, and like I was saying, the first team up of Charles Xavier and Magneto, they united to get some Nazi gold back from old Baron Von Strucker. Ah, uh, Von Strucker was a good villain while he lasted. It's true. I was really disappointed with how they just kind of murked him in Age of Ultron. Although, he got some great lines. And like the aforementioned, I'm going to surrender. He's great in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV series. Exactly. Finally, they got an A-list actor playing, and they can afford him on ABC. Yeah. It's Disney. There's some some money God, on. I can't believe we almost let the bar sinister slide on that one. I know. Fools that we were. <laughs> I love me doing me a good dramatic reading. But, uh, yeah. So, we got one more thing to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's uh, the Batman costume got a full daylight review, which leads my theory to the fact that they revealed the costume uh, because uh, DC knew. was well aware that these pictures yeah. were going to come out and be less than flattering because, yeah. honestly, uh, set pictures of costumes are usually not the way to reveal Especially things. for stunt scenes in particular, because then you're getting a version of the costumes designed to keep this performer safe, not necessarily look good on camera. Yeah, because they're all talking about, where's his cape? Where's his cape? And I'm like... CGI it's a motorcycle. That's going to be CG as hell. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. really want to risk getting your cape stuck in a back wheel? Ooh, that's bad news. And that said, I love the design of the back cycle. That's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> it's slick. I like the little ears on it. Yeah. It's good stuff. What's going on with the gauntlets? Those look like arrows. Yeah, that could be cool. Yeah. I think that might just be like a special motorcycle variant so we can go pew, pew, pew. Or maybe he's got the good old uh, Huntress crossbow. I mean, that'd be fun. He'd be the crossbow killer. <laughs> I loved it. I looked. I thought it looked great. Yeah, it looks pretty rad. And I love the ear. I love the little pointy ears. Looks like he's going to stab someone with those things. Uh, yeah, I think one news reporter put it as uh, uh, not as big as the uh, uh, Michael Keaton, but bigger than uh, uh, Batfleck. I, I, like, I like me some short ears. I really dug Batfleck's look, but I'm digging this one, too. Yeah, I think this is going to go. I like this. I, I, I noticed he's got some eye coverings, which, yeah. you know, I think they should Goggles put on Batman for a him. long time yeah. ago. Even if it's not just for the full time costume, at least for the motorcycle bits, I don't yeah, want Batman being like, "Oh God, my eyes." <laughs> <laughs> this is I, I I really like the pictures on this one. I I do wish that we had gotten a proper reveal so we could get a really good look because we still don't know what the caped outfit really yeah. looks like. And it's clear that this outfit is supposed to have the cape because the cow tuck yeah is around his neck. I, I kind of like the little collar. Yeah, he's so got we're going clearly on. dealing with a, a CG cape, and people are bitching and complaining about it. Need to realize that hey, CJ CGI capes look great. Yeah, especially for this. <laughs> exactly. And uh, one last bit of news that kind of snuck in under the radar. Oh, yeah. Uh, Harley Quinn season two already has a premiere date, and it's in like two months. Yeah, they're pres- they're, they're putting the gas on this one. Apparently, uh, DC one uh, had this in the wings. And with as well as uh, Harley is doing, they didn't want to pull a, a, a Disney plus you know, hey, let's do The Mandalorian and make you wait eight months for the sequel <laughs> while you start canceling on us. DC's not wasting any time. And within a month and a half on April 3rd, we're going to have our second season of a full 13 episodes. Nice. From what I've heard, apparently it was originally shot as a full 26 episode season, mm-hmm. but they made the decision to cut in half so you can pace you out. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, me too. That's a reasonable amount of time. Uh, I, uh, so far, the heart, the the uh, animated series has been great. I'm I saw that it finally wrapped up today, and I'm excited to finally sit down and check it all out. Don't know when I'll get to do that, but I've heard nothing but good things. Oh yeah, I haven't seen today's episode. You're right. I do know it's got my boy Kite Man there. Yeah, hell yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. But you know what? I, oh, oh, that's right. There were the, the, oh god, I'm I'm thinking about what happened in the last episode. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> Should we talk about that? I haven't seen it, so please don't. You haven't don't. seen last episode? No, I haven't seen any episode. So you don't episodes. know what this face is all about? No. Damn. Go watch the episode. Fine, I'll go watch it. Add it to the list. Harley Quinn, Picard, What <laughs> else? Star Trek Discovery. What yes, else am I missing? Yes. Uh, you know how painful it is to come to these recordings and want to talk about Picard, and he never has ever seen the episode. I'm in, I'm in the middle of this next-gen rewatch, ah. and it's so fun. Oh, it's revisiting old friends. Where are you at now? Um... Just saw my favorite episode from when I was a kid, Night Terrors, which... Oh, is that the Deanna Troy episode? That's the Troy episode that's basically PG Event Horizon. And Mm. I was watching, I was like, man, it makes 
a I would, I'd forgotten about it. And I'm watching like, oh, this was my favorite episode as a kid. That explains a whole lot of what I got into when I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite episodes were the lore episodes. I do like the lore episodes. And actually, I never knew about lore's return in season six. I missed those episodes as a kid. And I love those two early lore episodes. Where he was leading the Borg? Yeah, I didn't know that happened. Oh, wow. And I, but I was looking through like lists of best Star Trek episodes and I saw this like, Holy shit, that sounds amazing. I'm so excited to get to that now. It's my understanding that Lore got disassembled mm -hmm. after that episode. But with what's going on right now in Picard, it does bear mentioning, where's Lore? We got B4 stuff right here in uh, Memory Alpha. I'm assuming that is Memory Alpha that they're at. Or mm -hmm. the what, Dystrom Institute. Pick one. Um, but I wonder if Lore's parts are in there, too. And if so, is he the secret? They're getting data back. Get Brent Spiner that money. Got to get that Brent Spiner money. And uh, more than that, you no, know I really want to see show up in Picard. Mm. Moriarty. Oh, yeah. I, he's still kicking. He's still in that hall. Well, oh, that's right. He did exist, didn't he? I don't know. If he got, if he got blown up, if, if the Enterprise got blown up, what, in Generations, right? Mm hmm Yeah, I wonder if that took Moriarty with him. Hopefully they backed him up on the cloud. I'm getting a producer... Our producer's waving, losing his damn waver, mind over here. Waving at me, so. W what's happening? Tell us what's <laughs> happening, Rob. Is it is Timmy in the well? I'll tell you later. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, I, hopefully I'm getting some good news on Moriarty, but uh, I was going to wrap it up for today. Indeed. Enough of our babbling about Star Trek. So uh, more babbling about how you can get a hold of us on the various social medias and what, what, the, what the kids call the Instagram or yeah. all their stuff. We're on the gram. We're, we're on, on the gram. We're on the Twitter. I'm we're killing it. We're on the YouTube. As Tell us about our new lighting. We're getting yeah. bathed in brand new lighting. About to say, Casey looks great. I probably look I like look death. I look good. For once. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm going to have to compete now and start wearing stage makeup. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, what else we got going on? Uh, we got our Patreon is still going on. Yeah, exactly. Please. Uh, which apparently now that we completely, we can't seem to start an episode without completely screwing it up. Yeah. You we're filling up that uh, blooper reel. You get a whole lot of B-reel, folks. Yeah, we're definitely going to be doing that. Um, we are also on Twitter, although I, I don't know if we've, have we, have we tweeted anything, Rob? We have? What was it? Pictures of Spider-Man. You have no idea. Okay, it's picture of Spider-Man's butt. That's what we're doing. That's our new Twitter thing. Spider-Man's butt. Look for that icon. Um, what else do we got going on here? Uh, <laughs> I think that just about covers it. <laughs> I think that just about covers it. This has been Spider-Man's butt. See ya.